TC is set. How are you? I'm Martin C. And welcome to A Seat at the Table. We have this profound moment that it's Black History Month. But also inside this moment are the individuals who make history. The beauty of this entire process are for those who are the storytellers. There's an art to storytelling. There's a proposition. There's a griot moment. And there are those who have taken their lifetime and created a craft that paint a picture for us that gives us the O to our black history. Today, we are proud to welcome one of the most profound and prolific writers who has brought together not only the song of our spirits, but has raised our ancestors' legacy through his illustration and illumination of the very idea of what the art and responsibility and the appropriate movement that he has started since he began his craft. I'm speaking of none other than my dearest brother, the phenomenal literary genius, and I did say genius, because in his own profound way, he is giving his soul as a testament to what is possible that was absent prior to him coming to this forefront and never veering from making his art, the art of storytelling. Welcome, Kevin, to a seat at the table. Munson, thank you so much. You're very kind. I just say all praises due to God, and I'm just uh, a vessel. Thank you so much. Well, I, I, I think we wait. I, I was telling a dear friend of mine, she's 75. I said, okay. if you don't see a documentary now, they'll be doing the documentary. 10 years from now, you will not understand most of the words. All the people that see you won't really be your friends. Mm. And you'll be there and feel very alone. So yeah. if something tragic happened tomorrow, at least you would know that one, I said, I love you. Two, the yeah. art, the very proposition for anybody who would see it later would know exactly how I want them to perceive or use use my lens and roll them out and the lens of what it is to be genius. See, far too often we look outside. We're looking for Einstein instead of looking for Langston. We're looking mm. for Elon instead of looking for Kevin Powell. Here we are looking outside of ourselves when there's someone dedicated to eradicating, even with the book that we talked about this morning. Mm. When you sit back and think that you were talking about race, politics, and have continued to talk about it in ways that men, because a male voice often gets lost in the ideology of what it is to be a black man. Mm. Langston, Langston hit people so hard that being a black man meant so much, but the movement of his people appeared to me to mean more. Mm. So part of storytelling is why we're here tonight and just the proposition of how stories come to you and the very artistic approach you use to storytelling. Well, well first of all, I want to acknowledge my favorite writer ever, Langston Hughes, since you just mentioned him. And Langston, this is his birthday. He was born in February 1st, 1902. He would be 119. <laughs> this is 119. Ah. And I also want to acknowledge, you know, the art of storytelling, it's, it's us as a people, as black people throughout the diaspora, you know, uh, Chicago, Detroit, New York, all over the South, the West Coast, the West Indies, the Caribbean, Africa, wherever we are, we've had this gift of, of storytelling. And so my family are proud Geechees from the low country of South Carolina. My mother and two of her sisters migrated up north to Jersey City, New Jersey, where I was born. And my mother, as she was raising me, Unfortunately, as a single mother, we were very poor. The, there was two things that my mother gave me. 
One was a love of music, which is why I, I believe I ended up becoming a music journalist in my lifetime because I was listening to, she would tell these stories about Marvin Gaye, about Sam Cooke, about James Brown, just these, these, these legends, Aretha Franklin. But then she was always telling stories, this oral history that we share with each other. I literally learned my entire family history just from listening to my mother or her, my mother and her sister, my aunt Kathy in the kitchen of our apartment. And it was really incredible. And I didn't realize at the time that I was being taught how to tell stories, how to be a listener, you know, how to observe what's happening around me. And it really it really started back then. I also got a love of storytelling just from going to church. The black church, as you know, Brother Munson, is like theater. It's like a movie. It's theater. It's comedy. You know what I mean? It's a drama. It's all those things going together. And, you know, particularly if you went to the kind of church that I went to, which was Pentecostal, you don't know where it's going to go. It's like all kinds of improvisations, freestyle and remixing happening. And I'm sitting there as a child taking all of that in. And then the third place is just in our community. When you listen to the brothers on the corner, you know, be it the elders or the young brothers, the brothers standing by the liquor store, <laughs> you know, the way we were speaking rhymes. I'm not going to repeat it because you got a you got an audience here. And I'm sure there's some younger people, some children in, involved. But I heard everything I feel by the time I was 10 years old that prepared me for using language. And I tell you, um, when I think back on it, I also learned very early to appreciate uh, the different ways that black people speak. You know, my mother sent me to school to get what she said was a better education than she had. She only went to the eighth grade. She had to drop out to work in the fields as a, as a child and work in people's homes. And so, you know, I was going to school speaking one way. Then at home, I had the beautiful Southern dialect of my mother, Geechee, the dialect. And then you had the urban dialect of the community outside. And so even there, when we talk about the art of storytelling, I was learning how to speak in different languages you know, early on, and I didn't realize it, you know, and it wasn't until I got to uh, college because of the civil rights movement made it possible for people like me, first generation college students, the first generation coming after the civil rights generation, you know, I didn't know that black writers existed months and until I got to college. I'd never heard of Langston Hughes, Zora Neale Hurston, Toni Morrison, Mary Baraka, any of those folks. Um, and I had a class with a sister named Dr. Cheryl Wall at Rutgers University, New Jersey, who died just about a year ago. And um, it was called the Harlem Renaissance. That's where I discovered Langston. Blew my mind. You know, I was like, well, who's this dude who's writing poems like I've known Rivers? He's writing about Africa. You know, you know, who's this dude who's writing this poem called Harlem? What happens to a dream deferred? Does it drive like a raisin in the sun? Who's this woman named Zora Neale Hurston that has written this book called Their Eyes Were Watching God, where the whole book is in the dialect of Florida, of Florida black folks, speaking the way my family speaks in South Carolina. And she was proud of it. That's what did it for me, you know, um, listening to Malcolm X's speeches, um, you know, listening to Bob Marley, you know, the great artist from Jamaica. February is not just Black History Month, but it's also Reggae Music Month as well. Um, you know, uh, listening to Marvin Gaye's What's Going On, which is a whole nine song out of stories and starting to see that, you know what? I could do this. And I got my first check, Nelson, uh, 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 you know, because of people, I mean, when I said Nelson, thinking about Nelson George, Greg Tate, writers that I read when I was younger, you know, who are writing in New York and professionals already. But I got my first check as a writer when I was 20 um, because I was in a hurry to tell stories. And when I was when I had gotten to college, the two things that happened for me, writing and activism, the activism, I became woke, as we say in these times, months in. And I said, you know what? I got to be involved in the community. I got to do work because when I got to college, Nelson Mandela was in jail. I didn't know what apartheid was. I was learning about that. Jesse Jackson was running for president. That blew my mind. You know, it's funny. The name of this program is a seat at the table. Shirley Chisholm. I didn't even know who she was. I didn't know any of that stuff. And so I also realized early on that part of my job as a storyteller was to tell the stories that had been denied to people like me when I was growing up. And so I just kind of merged the two because I feel that writing storytelling is a form of activism, just like you only rolling, rolling out and having this platform for two decades now is not just a form of business or leadership, but is also a form of activism that we're going to be advocates for what has been missing and what we need to have there. You know, you think of um, someone like a James Baldwin, mm. all of a sudden very chic. Yeah. And yeah. Black or gay was ever chic. That's right. He spoke out. Yeah. And it kept a movement forward. And I think that um, for anyone that knows your art, when you paint these ideas, because you've painted many, I mean, you've been an advocate for so many. The activism okay. and the art coming together, what does it feel like? I think, is there moments uh, of freedom? Is there moments of doubt? And then, and then what does it take to keep pushing that art 
as you've begun to understand the craft because it has to stay in you? Well, that's a great question. I Writing is as important to me uh, as breathing. Art is as important to me as breathing. That's number one. If I couldn't do this, write, create, and I write every single day, like literally when I get off this, 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 this conversation with you in an hour or so, I'm going right back to writing because I have things that I have to, I got to get out of me. Um, it is freedom. It's, it's self-empowerment. It's therapy. It's healing. You know, I've been able to, to make sense of my life. You know, I've written pieces about what it is to be a black man in America, which you were speaking about earlier. I've written about what it's like not to have a father in my life. We'll have the pain of that. I've written, I've made peace with my mother through the years that she's, my mother literally has appeared in everything that I've written in some form or fashion because she's the most dominant person I've had in my life. And I've gone from, you know, all kinds of uh, ideas and feelings about her to loving and accepting her for who she is. That's because of my art, storytelling. You know, her voice is in my head all the time. Um, I've also been penalized badly. You know, I've lost opportunities, jobs, et cetera, because I've, I've chosen to speak out because, you know, as a black male, uh, there's a certain kind of fear of us, you know, Richard Wright, you know, James Baldwin, uh, Mary Baraka, we can go through a whole bunch of storytellers who have been, uh, you know, ostracized, marginalized, you know, because they chose to challenge this, the, you know, systems of oppression, challenge racism. Um, I've had people avoid me. I've had people say that, you know, you know, I'm sure you've had it months when people call you angry, all kinds of stuff, as if Donald Trump can be angry, white men can be angry, but black men are not allowed to show the whole dimension of who we are, you know, um, or people will take our passion as a way of saying that we're angry, you know I mean? And so I've had to use my art to, to, to challenge a lot of stuff. And there's been, you know, there's been times when I've been, I've done well, you know, financially, otherwise there's been times where it's been very, very lean. You know, I text you this morning, like, yo, last year was rough in a lot of ways, not just because of COVID. COVID was part of it, but it was a whole bunch of stuff going on because also we have to understand when we talk about the art of storytelling, you know, I do believe that black women and black men catch hell equally, but I think it's different. And I think that black men represent a different kind of threat where oftentimes we are asked to silence ourselves or to just kind of fit into some sort of box, you know, and I don't know any brother that can just fit in some box, you know what I mean? And just, you know, you're asked, you, you, you know, if you're not considered safe, then something must be wrong with you. And I've had to write my, I've, I've had to create stories, art out of all of that stuff, you know, because part of the challenge of being a black person in this world, in this country, in this world, both is, you know, the, our stories help us to navigate this. Like, it's like a roadmap, you know, which is why when people ask me what to read, you got to read Frederick Douglass's autobiography, his, 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 the, the narratives of him, you know, coming up through slavery. You got to read Booker T. Washington's Up From Slavery. You got to read the autobiography from Malcolm X. You got to actually, I believe, read, not just listen to, but read Dr. King's speeches and hear what he was grappling with. I think there's few things as powerful as the mountaintop speech in, in terms of a piece of literature, because he's really giving his own eulogy the day before he was killed. And he's saying he's seen some things, you know, because part of storytelling for black folks is not just talking about where we are now, but it's also, I have a dream. I've been to the mountaintop. You know, this is where I think we're going, you know? And so for me, uh, for black people, Munson, storytelling is life-saving. It's life-saving because we, if we're not able to speak through jazz, blues, spirituals, gospel, hip hop, soul music, you know, uh, our literature, our paintings, our dance, all the art forms that we have, I think, you know, I don't know if we'd be here even, I don't know if we would be sane. It, it helps us to make, you know, Mary Baraka said it best, art storytelling helps to create organization out of the madness and the chaos of this world. That's what it's done for me. Even with the highs and lows of it all, I wouldn't trade this role for anything else because I know what it's done for my life to keep me going. You know, the interesting thing that I would like people to know is you said it really quickly and and sharing a part of you and as you read um someone like a, a james baldwin or a langston hughes they're sharing something with themselves that they can't get back once they print it yeah so you say 2020 was a difficult time so as a male if you're developing art and as a character um for those who are watching a black man, I cried every night without tears being able to come across my face. 
but they covered my entire space, my ego, my ideas of who I was to be. I was absent standing in front of the mirror. I couldn't even see me. The pain erased who I was and society did not care. I was a black man and I wanted someone to see me, but I was present nowhere. So in making that up, I was saying kind of like what I thought when I heard what you were saying and how pain kind of erases us in a society that always wants us to be last. Yeah. And the fact that it wants black to be last. Yeah. And the fact that it wants black to progress together. And so then the artist has to begin to paint a picture for people in a society who might not only have a mom who's struggling, but may not even have the inspiration or the courage that it takes to be you in that moment to be free and to write the art of what you've gone through to be able to express it out loud so the world see because you can't take it back. Yeah. So that's you know, what I heard you saying that. It was powerful about what you just said. I'm sitting here. Like, I love Toni Morrison. I love Alice Walker, Intazaki Shange, Nikki Giovanni, Sonia Sanchez, Audre Lorde, Bell Hooks. Um, in fact, I, I cannot imagine being the man that I am if I didn't come at some point to reading all these amazing Black women writers, these black, amazing Black women storytellers. I need to say that first and foremost. There is the direct connection between my mother and my aunts and my grandmother and those great women writers. But I, I'd be remiss if I didn't say, when I'm 18 years old, and I began to read the autobiography of Malcolm X. And I'm going on this journey, this story of this character, Malcolm Little, you know, uh, you know Omaha, Nebraska, you know, he's Detroit Red, he's living in Lansing, Michigan, you know the story, Malcolm's bouncing around, Boston, New York, all of it, and how he ended up in prison. And then how he started reading the dictionary and started with the word aardvark, the letter A, and read the whole dictionary, seven years in jail, and how he comes out and becomes this incredible speaker you know and, and he was constantly changing in that one story the art of storytelling when i put the book down munson and i'm sure i'm not the only black man who would say this i just started crying i had no idea he had been killed you know what i mean and i said to myself and what i took from malcolm because i didn't have a father i said well i'm going to borrow from him whatever i can to help me be a better man he used to underline things with a red pen. To this day, I still got a whole bunch of red pens right by me. Malcolm always wore a watch. He always was sensitive about time. You know, he always he said he wouldn't let 15 minutes go by with idle time. I read every single day something or I listen to something. I watch something that helps me to learn. You know, then I got to Richard Wright. I read Black Boy. Blew my mind. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? On another level. And how, you know, how important the library was to him. You know, and I said, wait a minute. This is this is a there's a pattern here. Richard Wright's talking about books, Malcolm X talking about books, and both of them dropped out in the eighth grade, but they eventually became these incredible storytellers you know, in their own ways. You know, and years later, I would discover a, a playwright, a storyteller named August Wilson from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And he's writing plays set in every decade of the of the of the, the last century, the 1900, 20th century. And I'm like, he's doing the same thing. And then I found out August Wilson dropped out in the eighth grade too. I was like, wait a minute, what's going on here? What I, what I point I'm getting to is that what they all had in common is in spite of everything that had happened to them as black men, August Wilson, Malcolm X, and Richard Wright, they still found within themselves the ability to tell their stories which actually empowered them and empowered countless millions of people. You feel what I'm saying? It was they, they they turned their lives, they turned their own personal stories, their own personal tragedies into something that actually saved the lives of people like me who came along as, as you know, later on. And that, that is why we have to tell stories. You know, um, I remember the first time I met a Mary Baraka. I had read him in college. I, I, I couldn't even I just couldn't even look him in the face. I just was like, because I, I, I was like this because he was from New Jersey like I was. I was like, man, he's, he's from Newark. I'm from Jersey City. So it's, now it's getting closer to home. You know, I didn't live in a city like Chicago or Newark where you see or, 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 or Atlanta where you see a whole bunch of black folks doing all kinds of incredible things, you know, and that touched me, you know. And so I think about. Um, yeah, but y'all uh, had the art, the art that you're talking about. And he obviously. Yeah. Um, you know, we're amplifying black stories. Obviously, Penguin's one of the people that the companies that sponsor what we're talking about mm -hmm. here. But 
when you say that, I want to dial back because you're kind of saying it and assuming that there's a man like you, a listener who knows who Mr. Baraka was. Right. And when you say it, that's also publisher like you. So whether they're going to publish you today as a black man, or whether you're going to publish, I mean, the whole idea of amplifying black stories is so that they can, the whole idea of amplifying. So they may not even know that not only was he writer, but his publisher. And and it, it, there were moments when what he was writing was truly not accepted. And if he hadn't written it, nobody was going to say it. That's right. That's right. So you can flip it around. Well, I mean, I'll tell you, um... <laughs> We live in a world that does, oftentimes does not want to hear the truth from black storytellers. I mean, I will say that it's been shocking and surprising, and in some ways a relief that Black Lives Matter exploded the way it did after we saw the story, literally videotaped, of George Floyd being kneed to death for eight minutes and 46 seconds in Minneapolis, Minnesota. And it opened up a whole bunch of spaces that had been shut down. I can't tell you how many people said to me, since last year, to up until last week, just the last couple of days, months, and hey, Kevin Powell, I realized the stories that you were telling in Vibe Magazine, on MTV's The Real World, and the, the many blogs and poems that you've written, you know, I didn't hear it the way I should have heard it before. Now I see you're telling the truth. And I'm saying, you know, and if you live long enough, sometimes it comes back around, but the reality is, you know, we still live in a world that is incredibly racist, which is why Black History Month exists in the first place. Because like I said to you on you all on the show this morning, Carter G. Woodson created Negro History Week in 1926, which became Black History Week, Black History Month, pardon me, in 1976 after the Civil Rights Movement, when we went from being Negro to Black, because the stories of Black folks were often missing from everything. I was an A student months in Steve K through 12 because my mama, but for A for education, did not tolerate bad grades. And she said, you have to go further in life than I did. I, you have to take education seriously. But how is it that I can go to a school where there's kids of all backgrounds, including black children like you and I, and there's no nothing other than black folks were slaves. That was a paragraph or two. And Rosa Parks didn't give up her seat. We didn't get anything deeper than that. And Dr. King had a dream. We didn't even get the whole speech. And then he was dead. That was the totality of black story telling from K through 12. But I got Columbus over and over again. I got George Washington over and over again. I got Abraham Lincoln over and over again. Other people's stories. And so when people do that, what we now call white supremacy or racism, you know, storytelling should not re reinforce the superiority of one group of people over another group of people. Storytelling should not erase people and erase their whole histories because what that ends up doing is what it did to me and what it did to generations of black people in this country and around the world. We think that our lives are not valuable. We hate ourselves and we start to think that other people's stories and their lives are more valuable than ours, which is why black storytelling does matter. And the art of black storytelling is absolutely necessary. I had to go from self-hatred to self-love. And the only way I was able to do that is because of all those black storytellers that we've mentioned here tonight. You know, when you say um, writers and writing, there is a passion that you have. When you're perfecting your art and you're looking at the body after 14 books, thousands of articles. Yeah. What is it that when you begin for that young artist who's really trying to find his voice, what would you say to them about putting that first image and idea that they had on paper so that they weren't afraid and weren't ashamed, no matter how the words didn't come together, no matter how they didn't have. And then how do they find someone to begin to help to shape them, to be who they want to be and know that there's no shame, that you're not perfect, that the imperfection is part of your art and part of your ultimate story? Well, that's a, that's a great question as well. Um, you're asking really great questions. I I actually run a writer's workshop called Kevin, pa Kevin Powell's Writing Workshop on Facebook, and we're actually going to start it back up February 9th via Zoom. And in our first set, we did 10 weeks last year. And the first thing that we, I said to folks, because I noticed that there were people who were hesitant to even call themselves a writer or a storyteller. You have to claim who you are. You can't just say, I think I'm an artist. I think I'm a dancer. I think I'm a, a painter. 
I think I'm a writer. I am a writer. I am a storyteller. I am a writer. That's our mantra. I am a writer. And I had to claim that early. And again, but when I started reading these folks at 18, 19, 20, the Mary Barakas, the Richard Wrights, folks like that, uh, Claude Brown, you know, there's so many people I can think of. H Haki Mahabudi from Chicago, you know, um, it let me have the courage that I needed. It's no different than when Muhammad Ali was saying as a 22 year old man, I am the greatest. What he was doing was teaching black people that if you don't affirm yourself, no one else is going to affirm yourself, affirm you for you. This is the part, this is the art of storytelling. And Muhammad, Muhammad Ali is even the, among the people I would include as one of our great storytellers. You know what I'm saying? Um, and then you got to read. You have to read the best writers that have ever existed. And that's what I mean. You know, I love Shakespeare. I love Chaucer. I love John Donne. I love Emily Dickinson. And then I also, once I started discovering Black and Latinx and Asian Native American writers, I added them to it. And to this day, I've never stopped reading. You have to be as excited about the first piece you ever publish as you are the most recent piece. I've been writing now for professionally for over 30 years. I'm still excited every single time I finish a piece. I wrote a piece when Cicely Tyson di died last week. I wrote a poem called for Cicely Tyson that'll get published, you know, by tomorrow, if not tonight, you know, and I am as proud of that piece as I am of my cover stories on Tupac Shakur, the cover story I wrote on Stacey Abrams last year for the Washington Post magazine, everything that I can finish you know, I put my soul into, I'm proud of it. It's like a, it's like a new child. And I think we got to keep that childlike uh, energy around art, the, the art of storytelling. Like you got to always love, you got to love what you do. Like what I do doesn't feel like work. Is writing hard? Is telling stories hard? Yeah. You know, I'm literally right now, Munson, working on a biography, my 15th book on Tupac Shakur. I've been working on this book for at least the last 10 years, at least the last 10 years. I've interviewed over 200 people all over the country and internationally. I've traveled to different places. I've been gathering all this information. I've been watching stuff, listening to stuff. It's a tremendous amount of work. But now as I'm putting pen to paper, typing stuff up, I'm like, I can't wait to get this book done because I want people to learn about Tupac Shakur, all the new things that I thought I, I didn't know. And I interviewed Tupac, wrote four cover stories on, on him back in the 1990s. But I take the craft of storytelling so seriously. I'm like, I got to present this in a way that people have never seen Tupac before. That's my responsibility as a storyteller. That's my long pause. I, I, okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, I think when you say it, and, I, and I'm glad you said it, um, but when you say people like a Richard Wright, when you say yeah. um, James Baldwin, and all of a sudden you start seeing T-shirts, I'm not your Negro. Yeah, yeah. He's taking a position. I, I, um, I veered off when you described Ali saying, you're the greatest. I, I think it was more of a movement where he was saying to everybody else, we are the greatest. Mm -hmm. I, I need you to replace my I with a we so you can understand I'm really saying this for you because you can't beat them and say it. You can't talk to the microphone and look at them and say how pretty I am. I'm saying how black I am, but you may mm -hmm. not believe it. You may not get that. And, and even now with them bringing and going from Beale Street, taking love and seeing black love come to movies. The whole idea premise that there was a moment where all these great black men came together, even a movie right now, where they're talking yeah. about Ali came and all of a sudden there were others that were in the room. These are us reimagining storytelling That's right. with an art that includes we. So we might begin to have a perspective to be more honest about our movement. Because the, right. the art of storytelling that I find, even in your work, challenges us to be in loving of the entire community. Because mm -hmm. when, until we get that we are the greatest, they will always be able to find one or two in that story that's better than the rest and leaves the rest. And I think that what your art has said is we have to look at ourselves in a way. If you're doing Tupac, then all of a sudden we're gonna have to look at our way as a fallen giant mm. who was assassinated in life, premature for sure, but created a body of work and an art and became a visionary that no one was anticipating, but clearly laid four or five roadmaps 
for those who want to immerse themselves in study. So then here comes the great man who's now getting ready to put another lens on it so it can be stitched together in a way that people can now understand it in a time where in his absence, many young kids will read your book and were not born when That's he right. passed. Yeah. So he is my lead for anybody in hip hop. He was throwing more punches, telling far more true things. And at the end of the day, did all the things with Dear Mama, to picture me rolling. You got, a, you got a whole concept of a black storyteller who also loved another black storyteller like you, enough to even say, well, y'all were brothers. Everybody can't say they interviewed Tupac four times. You know, and people, will be envious, people will be envious of that experience. People will work to diminish your genius. People will work to say that wasn't anything. And yet, the very same people will have never interviewed him one time. Never been in the room with him one time. You know, it's, it's deep what you're saying, because even, you know, Tupac, we met in Atlanta, Georgia, actually, at, at the Jack the Rapper conference, music conference that used to happen down there back in the 90s. And then probably before that, I'm not sure. But um, um, I had been on the first season of MTV's The Real World, and he had become a star because of Juice and his music. And I was hesitant to go over to him because there was a lot of people around him. And I was with a sister named Carla Radford who worked with us at Vibe Magazine, and she eventually became the event producer for Vibe. And so she went into the crowd and tapped Tupac on the shoulder and said, Tupac, that's Kevin Powell over there. He wants to write about you for Vibe Magazine. Tupac spins around, and he turned out to be as big a fan of mine as I was of his. You, you feel what I'm saying? And we eventually started talking, and he actually said to me, back to the art of storytelling, he said, I want you to be Alex Haley to my Malcolm X. Now, I remember thinking to myself, but Malcolm X is my hero. What if I want to be Malcolm X? <laughs> but the point Tupac was saying is that I'm trusting you with my story, you know, and it's deep because, you know, I don't know if you all can see this, but um, I'm going to hold it up for a second. I'm just going to spin this around. Uh, hold on. I'm not sure if I'm doing it right. Nope. But literally this four... Um, I couldn't show it to you, but it's four covers for on Tupac Shakur sitting right up above my my desk. Three for Vibe magazine and one for um, um, Rolling Stone. And that was unfortunately I was in Vegas when he died, and that was that was the last one. And I interviewed Tupac. I told his story in Atlanta, in Los Angeles, uh, in New York, in prison in New York. And you know, part of the storytelling, you know, if you happen to be a journalist the way I was. Um, you have a certain responsibility to to, 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 to to take the truth very seriously and to honor and protect, you know, um, 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 your integrity as a, as a storyteller, the art form of it, and try to be as balanced as possible. And I also knew that because he was a young black man, just like I was a young black man, you already got people saying all kinds of stuff about you just because you're a young black man. And my responsibility was also to try to be as balanced and fair as possible and put things in context. Because a lot of times I'll read stuff about us by other people that are outside our community and it's never in context. It's never in context of where, why is this happening? Who is this person? Why are they doing the things that they're doing? And I think that's, that's very important. So, you know, um, I can't wait to get this book done. It'll be, uh, I can't say when it's out. People ask me all the time, when's it coming out? I'm like, it'll be done when it's done because this storytelling also Munson, is a spiritual journey. We need to be very clear about that. It's not just something that is, um, you know, you can just spit stuff out and it's done. You know, sometimes I've done that as a journalist because you have deadlines, but when it's something as sacred for me as like, you know, writing my life story and the education of Kevin Powell or my essay book, Keeping It Real from back in the day or the new one, When We Free the World, which is out right now, or this biography of Tupac Shakur, I have to let the spirit guide what I'm doing. Otherwise it's not gonna work. Well, that's yeah. part of the art. I mean, that's yeah. that, the the art. It, it's tapping into something bigger. Um, yeah. Tapping into the, um, and I don't know how much truth always has to be present. It just has to sometimes, um, or all times, be a black truth from a black mm. man. So even if I wanted to make up all the things that Tupac didn't do, but I could hear that he wanted to do in that moment. I, I could read his mind and I was sitting in front of him reading his mind. Yeah. And as I sat there reading his mind, he just nodded me. We looked at each other and we kept on talking. And we didn't say what was on his mind, but he shared with me what was on his mind. 
And I was glad that I was there to show what was on his mind because he knew what was on my mind. And we both shared that as brothers. And we knew that this was a special moment. And then it would come a time where no, not only would I have to be his Alex Hayden, I would have to be his LeBron James. I would have to be his Muhammad Ali. Because I was going to have to be able to be all those black men that we know have always had to fight for everything they got and for something still to be taken away from them that they couldn't take with them when they went to see their ancestors. At That's the right. end of the day, everything they left, the people that we're talking about are treasures. So when we're not reading these giants, when we're not taking the time to even listen to books, now that you could have books that are, are on audio book, if nothing else, I want to encourage my community during February to listen to 28 greats. If you're not mm. certain who you want your child to be, then introduce them to the biography. That's right. So they can take the biography and paint a little picture on themselves about whoever you imagine that you are. If you were Wilt Chamberlain, before you were Michael Jordan, if you were Muhammad Ali, because you want to know what it is because you're pretty and got to fight, because you're pretty and you might want to say assalamu alaikum, because you're pretty and you know that you're right, because you know that you're going to have to fight for those who can't get in the ring. Mm. Many of the individuals that you talk about were fighting in rings. I mean, That's literally, right. August Wilson, it was, he was 65 when he got caught. But now everybody celebrates. And if you would see him when he moved, I remember photographing him when we were first starting rolling out, and he just looked. But he looked <laughs> like a brother. You know what I'm saying? He just looked like a brother. He was he, he never faded to want to be something other than a brother when he looked. Yeah. When you saw Pop and the people that you're talking about, that's a color, that's a stance, that's an ideology. That you could spend two to three chapters taking the time to etch pyramids, literal temples surrounding the presence of someone and sculpting something that people had never seen in words. And that's the art of what you do. Because you're sitting here creating these pictures and images and ideas for people to be able to put back on themselves because then they can wear it. If you don't paint it, they can't wear it. If you don't write the words, they can't put them on. And uh, mm. how do you make your word selection, Kevin? How do you let the word speak to you? How do you, you grow know, your book? Hilarious. Well, I mean, definitely reading and listening. Um, I, I, I love reading, but uh, the word selection oftentimes is, is something passing through me. Like when I wrote the Cicely Tyson piece, um, so I'm see if I have it here somewhere um, the other day. I mean, look, you know, I'm like a lot of people. I grew up with Cicely Tyson. She has been there as long as I've been alive, basically. And, and, and you know, you think about all the movies and roles she's been in and you know, it's called for Cicely Tyson. Uh, the first, the, I came up with two words. I just came up with girls, women. Those are the first two lines of the poem. And then I said, well, black girls, black women, especially rarely told they are smart, gifted, beautiful, special, dope, all in a single relentless breath, but you are. And so I started off with girls and women, and then the words just started falling to me. And then the next stanza is Africa and the West Indies hatched you in Harlem because she was born in 1924 when Langston and Zora, bring it back to Langston and Zora, you know, storytellers, penciled the blues and blackness into your diamond slanted eyes. Because I just love Cicely Tyson's eyes. As Ma Rainey, since we just saw Ma Rainey with Viola Davis on Netflix and Marcus Garvey, our great Jamaican warrior, swayed and screamed that little black girls like you are stars wherever they are. And then I go into not just the help, not just the mattress, not just the punching bag, not just the mammy, not just the pole watchers or the pole dancers, but, and these words, where did the words come from? They find you. I call black women miracle chocolate goddesses. That's the next line, miracle chocolate goddesses. And, um, you know, uh, some of it speaks to me, I think from our ancestors, from God. Um, I, sometimes I'll go, I mean, I obviously like a lot of writers, I edit stuff. But it was just flowing. It's like, you know, because I kept thinking about how as a kid, you know, the autobiography of Miss Jane Pittman, Cicely Tyson, you know, her playing Harriet Tubman. I still wasn't really clear, 
you know, even when I mean, my mother watched Roots as a kid and I didn't really understand Roots until years later. But Cicely Tyson seemed to be in everything. You know what I mean? She was this presence. And I just, you know, I said, I got to honor her. And she, the, the fact that she made it to 96, I was like, wow. You know, she knew James Baldwin. She knew Langston Hughes. She knew all these people. Were, you know, she crossed paths with all these people we talked about. Her life overlapped with all those people. You know, it's profound. In fact, she's born in the same year James Baldwin was born, 1924. Same year. And so, you know, how do I find the words? How to select the words? Oftentimes, Munson, they select me. I'm just a vessel. And anyone who's an artist, a storyteller will tell you sometimes you don't know where it came from. It just kind of flows through you and you got to listen to it. You got to listen to it. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to do a, a solid one day and attempt to write something. I, it, it was one of those things as an artist, she always just reminded me of being an artist. I never yeah. saw her as an actress. Yeah. I always saw her as an artist. Um, I mean, her whole body was storytelling, her face, her eyes, you know, her nose, her lips, her beautiful skin color her hair, the different hairstyles she wore. I think she was just embodying black storytelling. Her whole being was, you know? Wow. You know, uh, I have to say this because it came to my mind. We, we also lost Hank Aaron last week. I'm a, my first sports love is baseball. Um, you know, um, you asked about how do you find words? Last year, I found myself writing about John Lewis, Chavik Bozeman, you know, um, we, 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 you know, I, I, I used to say months in that I don't want to keep writing about people after they die. I wrote about Prince, you know, I'm thinking about people, but again, if we don't even control this, we don't tell the stories of who these people were, someone else will tell the stories for them. You know what I mean? And so I had to say, look, I met Chadwick Boseman when he was a young actor just out of college and he was in theater and you know what he did? Bring it back to my books. One of my 14 books, I can't remember which, which one it was, but sister Camilla Forbes who had gone to Howard university, HBCU with uh, Chadwick Bozeman said, Kevin, instead of a book party, you know, the way people do where you sit around and you read from your book, how about we act out some of the scenes in the book? And the actor that she picked was Chadwick Bozeman. That's how I met Chadwick Bozeman. And then years later, I wrote a cover story in Chadwick Bozeman for British GQ because of the explosion of Black Panther. And he was the same humble, kind person that I had talked, who I'd worked with all those years before. And you know what he said to me? He said, I want to thank you for what you do. For you know, for your story, and I said, man, you know, um, it's deep, man. You know, um, I believe if you're true to your art, Munson, you, it leads you to in, in cross paths with some really incredible spirits. You know, what I'm saying some really incredible spirits. I think about Chadwick a lot. You know, um, and the fact that he kept going, he wanted to tell stories. Jackie Robinson, Thurgood Marshall, Black Panther. You know, Ma Rainey's Black Bottom, his last thing, the the, the Five Bloods, the Spike Lee's Vietnam War film because he felt that no matter what, I gotta tell these black stories because they're gonna be here long after I'm here and they're gonna touch some people's lives. That's why black storytelling matters. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Well, I, I don't know that I see it like that. I think that um, it becomes a responsibility of the artist and the pictures that come across your mind. I'm, I'm not sure when you, intersect with them because of who you are um you're writing stories of someone who is still living and they're mm -hmm. living in art they're living in your art um it's like a color i don't i yeah. don't necessarily see you writing about someone who has passed and actually adding I color to life that people might have just left it black and they may not have started with miracle they may not have yeah. started with those kind of ideas or they may have forgotten because we've got to claim our greatness too. You've got to say, and I did this because you're in a society that wants to min minimize the black spirit of a gentleman that says, I will write about someone that you did not embrace. See, what, let, let us not all say now that it's cool to say I was listening to Tupac when he was really the antichrist to some people. That's right. It, was, it wasn't like they were, ooh, let's celebrate Malcolm X. They weren't passing out stamps when he was in Arkham. They weren't yeah. passing out no stamps. If he may have had yeah. a choice, he may have never wanted to be a stamp. The stamp choice is after. It's That's not right. before. This was greatness is seen. Then all the other authors go, 
but then that movement they hope has stopped. The question is, are people listening to that story that you're telling to understand that his sacrifice was so y'all will sacrifice so we can have a movement for amplified black voices, for amplified black storytellers, so that there is an art to that character. So for me, when you take a character, it's like color. Each mm -hmm. time you say, I put, I put this color on what I'm doing. I put color. You're sitting there yeah. adding color in words. That word is color. It wasn't just a tree. He wasn't just the greatest, as sweat profusely was coming across and erasing every moment, but he still was prepared for the next punch, which wasn't coming from the opponent. It was coming from everyone that wanted something and to take something away from him that was on the other side, whether it was his money, whether mm -hmm. it was his lifestyle. It was somebody who wanted to take something for the champ. And that's any champion of the black movement. Mm -hmm. So yeah, the storyteller becomes problematic when you really begin to understand that we all need to get to embrace the storyteller of blackness and say it loud, black, and understand that it is black and that mm -hmm. we need to celebrate. It didn't start, it's just a week. It was a week, so we recognized. We're still hoping others recognize. I'm like, why you want permission from them? Carter G. Wilson gave you permission already. Huh. It's your moment. Yeah. Well, I mean, Toni Morrison said it too. Let's stop centering everyone else except for ourselves. And that's the point of, of that's the point of black storytelling. Center your stories. Your stories matter. I remember when I was in college and I took one creative writing class. People always said, well, did you study writing? Not really, because the one creative writing class I had, I was the only black kid in the class at Rutgers University. And, you know, I used a word that says that we use the bathroom, S-H, y'all know what the word is, you know what I mean? And they were so stunned by what I wrote in the story because it was, you know, it was about the hood, straight up. It was about, I was told, well, write about what you know. That's what I knew. And the only feedback I got was that I should use the word shat instead of shh. And I was like, I don't know, nobody black that says I shat. <laughs> you know what I mean? And so, you know, to your point, you know, where do I find words from? I made it a point months into study and master the English language. I literally have at my desk where I'm sitting right now, five or six reference books, dictionary, thesaurus, you know, associated press style book, you name it, elements of style. You know, I read all kinds of publications, Sports Illustrated, The New Yorker, Ebony, Essence, whatever it is that's out there, Rolling Out Magazine. You know, I get it every single day. I get the alerts. I read everything. But I also value the way my people speak and tell stories. And I feel that part of my responsibility is to say that the language of my people, be it Atlanta, Chicago, Detroit, Haiti, Sapase, Jamaica, the West Indies, Patois, wherever it is in the world, is beautiful, beautiful poetry, just like Zora Neale Hurston was telling us in Their Eyes Watching God, just like Langston Hughes was telling us in his poetry. It's beautiful language. And that you can't have stories without a love of language and figuring out how to take that language and make it something that, that impacts a whole world of people. And I think that's what, I mean, that's what hip hop is. Hip hop started off with, with some African-Americans, West Indians and Latinx folks in the Bronx, New York, that language is everywhere. That art of storytelling is everywhere because they believed in themselves, you know? And um, that's how I feel. That's how I feel. Don't, you know, center your story. Center yourself. Know that you're valuable in every way possible. That's what I do. And find beauty and joy and even the simple things that you might think not, that's not important. But the, the way Munson Steed has his hat on is actually saying a lot about the history of cool and black men in America. You feel what I'm saying? The way your beard is groomed is saying a lot about how black men move in with dignity. You know, even the colors that you've chosen speaks a lot about who we are. And so when, as a storyteller, I observe what's going on. I look at how people sit, how they wear their hats, how they walk, how they talk, because all of that eventually finds its way into what I'm writing, if that makes sense. You know what I mean? No, thank you. I, but I think as we talk about character development, and I think the, for me, um, what I've appreciated in your voice, um, because there aren't enough black male writers who write on a regular basis. Um, when I think of a writer like you and you think about even uh, probably uh, Augustus, 
when he was thinking about his plays. He probably could have done 100. He probably mm-hmm. could have written 100 plays. Uh, you probably could write 100 books if you had the moment to pause and people would wait and mm-hmm. you wouldn't have to think so hard and you would be able to do the book, the song, the people, put it all in a tomb, let it get out. Uh, it's the prints. When you said prints, I thought about how even he had to leave all his treasures because there was so much that he wanted to get out black, free, beauty, life inside of him. Uh, I think those are the storytellers. There are more that we want to tell. There are more that we want to connect to. And I just want you to share um, how do you develop characters and even shape characters when you're interviewing people? Because that's what, after they read it, they will believe your words and those individuals are the characters that you've now, or the characterization of that person. Because if you're a beginning writer, how do you connect to that character? Oh, that's a great question. I want to bring it to Stacey Abrams since our sister just got nominated for a Nobel Peace Prize today out of Atlanta, straight out of Atlanta, Georgia. And we know that Georgia came through big time in the last presidential election. Salute to the people of Georgia. So last year, this literally a year ago, I was commissioned by the Washington Post magazine to write a cover story on Stacey Abrams. I was excited about it because I felt like, you know what, this is something that's very important. I follow very closely you know, the, the, the governor's race in 2018, and I do think that that race was stolen from her. I do believe there was voter suppression. I said, you know what? I need to get underneath the, the fanfare of who she is in the public eye. I need to know who she really is. And so how did I develop that story or that character arc of her? I had to meet her mom and daddy. That was very important. And I met them and learning that they had come from Mississippi and they had both participated in the civil rights movement in the 1960s in Mississippi and hearing how they both fought for voting rights and fought against racism. I said, huh, this begins to explain some things as I began to see, you know, how they moved around and made sure that all the children got an education, you know, um, how Stacy as a little girl was the one who was always in love with books and reading. I said, here's the narrative right here. There's no Stacey Abrams without the foundation of this black family. And inside this black family is this wonderful love story of this father and mother who have been together for 50 years and they produce, I believe, five children, if I can remember correctly. You know what I'm saying? And, you know, and then I had to take us to to, to Spelman College, you know, when Stacey was a young activist, you know what I'm saying? And I found video of her speaking at, you know, as a as a as a as a college student. And I said, man, so it was all there, but the foundation was the, the where she came from, her, her people. And I made it a point to say, you know, I've got to honor, because a lot of times we'll just throw it out there like, you know, like this is just some, you know, you know, Munster Steed had no parents. He just did it himself, all by himself, rolling out. There's no context. There's no one who affected his life that led him to do things like rolling out magazine. No, something touched your life at some point, whether it was a parent, parents, your community, a mentor, a role model, something same thing with her, because a lot of times when we talk about black storytelling, we always leave out the context of where our people come from. I refuse to leave out the context. Just like when I wrote about Tupac Shakur, I had to talk about Afeni Shakur. In the book, I talk about Afeni Shakur again. It's like, you know, and so for me, it's like, who, where do we come from? Because a lot of times we don't know because we never hear these stories. And I said to myself with Stacey Abrams, I want this to be the best article ever written on Stacey Abrams to date. Just like if you go to Esquire magazine, 2006, I wrote an interview, I wrote a profile, a cover story on Dave Chappelle. To this day, people still reference that Dave Chappelle cover story because he gave it to me, you know, right after he had left the Comedy Central show. Uh, show and it was the same thing. Dave Chappelle said something very simple to me. I'm the first person in my family since slavery not to go to college. That was the only, that's all I needed now to, 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 to start writing that story and realizing that, wait a minute, you know, he had relatives throughout his family that were race people, which explains why he does the kind of comedy that he does that's often challenging racism. You feel what I'm saying? And so that's how I create these characters, even in a, a nonfiction journalistic sense. I got to I gotta dig deep and find out, well, where did they come from? How did they get here? And if you don't do that, you don't really know who these people are. You just know that they're famous. That's it. That, that, isn't, that does a disservice to the people you're telling the story to. It's not a real story, it's not a complete story. Well, you know, and Stacy was actually an author too. She had a yes. pen name, wrote books. Yes. She had an imagination bigger 
than what many in Georgia would have ever imagined for themselves had she not decided to be Fannie Lou Hamer. Uh, That's had right. she not decided to be Fannie Lou Hamer. Had she not decided to be a modern Fannie Lou Hamer. So mm -hmm. when I think of uh, Stacy, that's who I think of. May say Stacy. Right. I want to say um, Sandra Bland. Um, mm. When I say her her name, um, I want to say for the abuse, um, Jessica Carey Moore. People who that's are right. are who, who said hello and what's up to you uh, when I yeah. interviewed her yesterday. Um, but it, it's I love a Jessica. different. Yeah, she loves you. She, she mentioned you probably twice during the interview, but my point was the love was real. The artist's love was real. The, the, the cadre of art and, and the fact that Stacey Abrams is an artist, but Fannie Lou Hamer was an artist and they both yeah. had Mississippi roots. And so when you say that, I only say that to add to the pain, to add to yeah. what you were saying, not to take away that the parents yeah, moved. But, but here it is, Fannie Lou Hamer is in Mississippi and Stacey Abrams is in Mississippi. Both of That's them right. affect the Democratic Party in a way that we may not be thinking of those stories. So don't just think about Stacey Abrams, think about Fannie Lou Hamer because Target is now thinking about Fannie Lou Hamer and put her name as part of a t-shirt and on the idea. So if they can do it, you can take the time to do it too and put her name on your shirt and put her name in your mouth. You know what's deep about you saying? I literally have to my right, I wish y'all could see it. I got Stacey Abrams on my wall and I got Fannie Lou Hamer on my wall. So it's really profound that you just said that. I don't know anything about these people you're speaking about. I'm, I'm just trying to learn about these people from you. <laughs> you know something about them. Fannie Lou Hamer was incredible. Fannie Lou Hamer was incredible. People just need to go look up the 1964 Democratic National Convention. Watch her speech on YouTube. It's incredible. We should be giving people resources. They should, they should watch that speech from Fannie Lou Hamer. Watch Eyes on a Prize. All 14 episodes are free on YouTube. It's just sitting there. The whole history of the Civil Rights Movement is incredible. And um, I would encourage people to go and read my piece on Stacey Abrams. It's called The Power of Stacey Abrams, Washington Post Magazine. Um, and I just, you know, if I could just say this last thing as about storytelling, Black storytelling, I write every single day not just physically right sometimes i don't physically write but my mind i i'm always thinking about what i need to say that's going to speak for this community that i belong to every single day of my life and i think if you really are a storyteller part of the art of it is to make sure you're in spaces where that is being fed and so i'm constantly listening to music today it was nina simone tonight it was curtis mayfield you know i was always listening to some reggae dennis brown and, and some other things but just making sure that there's an energy around me that's helping me to get these stories out of me because, you know, we have a lot to say and we need as many storytellers as possible, but also storytellers who take the craft of storytelling seriously, whether it's writing, again, dancing, filmmaking, as you know, Munson and other folks know, I'm actually moving into uh, filmmaking now and I have a documentary film coming out on black men and black boys, black fathers and black sons, which is a story really of black men in America. And that's how we're approaching this film as a storytelling piece for, for black males. So any, no matter who you are as a black male, you will see yourself in this film. That's our challenge to ourselves as the folks putting this together, because we take it that seriously. And we've been listening to brothers nonstop about what they feel and what they think about this world that we live in. And oftentimes we don't see the honest, authentic, whole self of black men as, as my friend Ed Garns from Atlanta always talks about, that's important. And I think that's part of being a storyteller Give people their whole selves. Give them their whole selves back. That's what it is for me. Yeah. Well, I want to thank you. I want to thank Penguin for amplifying Black voices. I want to thank you for sharing this time with your brother. I love you, man. I love what love you, you do. Thank you. Uh, respect that you have. I think it's a real significant um, journey because you're not finished. Uh, we love you here rolling out. Happy uh, February, Black History Month. Uh, Know Thank that we're you. here all for you, and uh, you see an Amplify Black story. So uh, peace and love to you, Kevin. I'll see you again. Uh, we got to figure out. That. I want to participate with that uh, that lab, so I'm going to follow up with a call. Um, okay. So we can find out, help you with that. All right? Thank, Thank you, you for brother. the opportunity. I appreciate it. Thank you. Hey, everybody. This is Monty Steve. You've been hanging out with me and my dearest brother, someone I love and respect, Kevin Powell. Uh, you do not have to 
be in the streets, but you do have to be in the struggle. I'll see you later for another seat at the table. Peace.